So that's back, that's forward. Yeah, okay. the, the arrows here. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Tuba, and I'm going to talk to you about our research on how the floods in Pakistan in 2022 affected um, children and their well being. So, um, research shows that. Uh, Research shows that, sorry, this is an older version of my slides. I'm a bit thrown off. Uh, but anyway, research shows that children in early childhood um, are especially vulnerable to um, any kind of environmental stressors. Um, and this is because this is a really critical age for their development in terms of their uh, immune system, their neurobiological functioning, um, and their psychosocial well-being. These children are also heavily reliant on caregivers who are also going through the same exact stressors as them. Uh, many times those caregivers are not able to fulfill their children's needs, um, at least not social emotional needs beyond just basic needs of safety and shelter. Um, so there's various psychosocial stressors, um, such as economic downturns that affect uh, the families and forced displacement as well. And um, it really affects Evidence says that it really affects um, health and well-being in general. We know that climate change is affecting us all, but children, especially young children, are more vulnerable than the rest of us. Um, so I want to talk about the research gap and why we undertook this study in the first place, other than the fact that I'm Pakistani myself. Um, so we know that there is, uh, you know, children have heightened vulnerability, but there is very limited coverage um, in terms of programming and um, research on the mental health effects of extreme weather events on young children, especially in low and middle income countries, which just tend to be more climate vulnerable. Um, existing literature does focus more on high income countries and children that are above or within um, developmental stages where they can communicate and above those developmental stages. So young children, especially in disadvantaged settings, are under-researched and they're underserved. Uh, so to address this gap, um, we conducted a systematic review. Uh, we, we went through over 25 databases, a mix of scientific databases and gray literature databases, agency websites, UNICEF, ev everything that we could think of at the time. Um, we identified 629 publications. We were looking for any sort of psychosocial program, um, you know, even if it was like storybook reading, anything really. We were so loose and um, liberal with our criteria. Um, that was done in any low and middle income country following a weather-based natural disaster, so not things like earthquakes. Um, and interestingly enough, and unfortunately, we found nothing. Um, so that became what I heard of for the first time. It became an empty review instead of a systematic review. Um, but more than just an empty review, it's sort of a really, really loud alarm um, and identifies a stark gap that you know, needs to be filled by people like ourselves um, and people in this room. So, uh, in 2022, Pakistan ex uh, experienced extreme flooding. Pakistan is the most, one, one of the top 10 most climate vulnerable countries. Um, it is home to diverse topographies, including mountain ranges, glaciers, plateaus, plains, coastal belts. Um, it experiences, much like our South Asian neighbors, we experience um, monsoon rains, and they, over the last couple of years, they've been getting progressively more and more intense and heavier. Uh, so Pakistan's economy is also very, very agriculture dependent, and any sort of environmental shock will affect um, people on multiple, multiple levels. So in August, 20, uh, in August 2022, um, over 33 million people were displaced. That, um, that highlighted part, sorry, that's from 2024. But um, almost 8 million people were displaced. Thousands and thousands of schools were turned into shelters that didn't bounce back to being centers of education for months, um, if not years. So um, we started planning to undertake this research in March, and in May we uh, received another flood warning by um, the IRC saying that, you know, Pakistan might get floods. By that time, my ethics and everything hadn't come through. We were waiting. We were hoping it wouldn't. Um, when I started collecting my data, uh, we 
and the area that I had chosen and gotten access to, um, we received a flood warning the night before. And as I was there, we, we started experiencing ex active flooding. That also meant that people were no longer, people who had agreed to participate in my research were no longer able to physically make their way to me. So, so far, as of mid-September, in this particular bout of um, flooding, 300 people have died, and at least 16,000 people, probably more, have been displaced. Um, my research, I went in to talk to them two years after the floods that they had experienced, but interestingly enough, it, it coincided with another flooding event. So the stories that I heard were um, you know, mixed between what happened then and what happened now. There's some text that got hidden behind the, these photographs, but ours was an exploratory qualitative study. Um, we didn't, when I was looking for things to ask them, there wasn't even enough literature that could guide my questions. So I essentially had to make my own questions that were informed by developmental stages and developmental milestones, but I also really had to, you know, use um, different vernacular because these people had such low literacy and they're so disadvantaged that I couldn't straight up ask, well, how is their mental health? Um, so I conducted semi-structured in-person interviews with 10 gender balanced parents in August 2024, so um, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, my research assist I had a research assistant there. We went to their homes. Um, and this is one of the villages that we had visited and you can, um, whoops, sorry, uh, gosh. So you can see that limited ac they already had limited access to um, clean water, sanitation, healthcare. Um, we spoke to, I'm just going to skip through this because I've been shown the five minute sign. Um, here are the ages of children that parents were reporting on. Um, and I'm, you can see key socioeconomic indicators for the regions that we did um, collect our data from. And it provides a snapshot of the living conditions um, which are highly relevant for understanding what they were going through. So you'll notice that a significant number of households were um, living with economic challenges, low literacy rates, um, you know, high number of children, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and especially for women, it really constrains their opportunities for upward social mobility. So some early findings. Um, We've not, this data set is very, very fresh. We've not completed analyses. We've only just started. So early indications are suggesting that um, children are experiencing developmental and psychological disruptions. Um, and there's, they're experiencing increased worry, fear, and distress. There are some quotes on the, um, uh, on the screen that I'm not going to read out, and I will encourage you to read those yourself. Um, they are more irritable. They're very scared of any kind of changing weather. They're, they want to be around their parents, but their parents are really annoyed by that as well because they need to leave them and go to the fields to get their daily wage in. Um, so that's happening. And then there's reports of sadness, mood fluctuations as well. They don't want to go out to places. They don't want to meet new people. They don't want to go to people they were already familiar with as well. They're crying more. They're expressing anger. Remember, we're talking about zero to eight. I don't have enough time to segregate those by age groups, but we're seeing this across age groups, even in children who are verbal. Um, and then there's learning setbacks and um, schooling, and th that has been um, disrupted as well. So they have, they're struggling to go back to schools, but also they have decreased interest in their surroundings now. Um, and then children are asking questions about their circumstances and future flooding. They're complaining about the houses um, that they're living in, and they're unhappy with how understocked their homes seem to be um, in case another disaster happens. Um, this is my last, one of my last slides, so hopefully I'm doing okay with time. Um, I want to say, and I really, really want to emphasize that these experiences, I don't mean to patho pathologize them. I don't mean to say, oh, that, you know, they're, they're signifying disorder. They're, they're perfectly proportionate and expected responses to the insecurity and the environmental and, and social disruption that they've been through. So, you know, um, the changes in their behavior are really, really just what you would expect from any child who's going through such severe distress. Um, intervening in early childhood is crucial because this is a time of heightened neuroplasticity, as I've mentioned, and extreme weather events and associated stressors can fundamentally alter developmental trajectories. Um, if left unaddressed, these adversities can lead to long-term developmental disadvantages. Um, parents emphasize how their economic insecurity um, after the floods affects every aspect of their lives. Um, 
And so parental stress also impacts their ability to look after their children. Um, and finally, to address these gaps, um, comprehensive evidence is obviously needed. We need to know more about how children are affected, what are the specific mechanisms through which they're affected. We need to focus on critical windows of development. Um, and you know, parents, are, parents and caregivers act as primary um, gatekeepers, essentially, in children's lives. Um, so engaging them in program is likely to make the interventions more effective. Um, we should focus on the first thousand days of life. Those are meant to be the most important. So um, my f I, I want to end by saying that you know we need to integrate early childhood programming and uh, early childhood development and mental health programming into sectors that are already prioritizing human humanitarian settings like WASH, um, you know MHPSS, maternal and child health. Um, those are also acceptable to the key stakeholders that restrict or you know grant access for these families. Um, this would also allow us to leverage the resources that do exist. Um, thank you very much. I just want to acknowledge my supervisors, my funding sources, my research assistants, um, and IGHN for putting up with my seven different versions of slides. Thank you very much.